we are looking at the IFS. Uh, we were doing a big review of the pension system. I think some of what we've got is good. I think a, a straightforward flat rate state pension makes sense. You build on that with private saving. But as we've discussed, there are, there are definitely things you need to do on the private side. And I think one of the things that is much under discussed is this issue about essentially nobody annuitizes now. You get to retirement with a pot of a hundred thousand pounds or a million pounds or whatever. Again, it's in my book. I can't remember exactly the numbers, but a 65 year old man has got something like a 25% chance of dying before it hits 75 and a 25% chance of living beyond 90. How the heck are you supposed to manage your finances in that level of uncertainty? Hello and welcome to the Fundamental Asset Podcast Series with me, Lee Cleesby, and your co-host, Chris Boxall. Today, we are delighted to introduce Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who is perhaps one of the UK's best-known economists. Paul is a regular on BBC Radio 4 and also writes a column for the Times newspaper. He is also a published author with a Times bestseller, Follow the Money, How Much Does Britain Cost? Paul is here to talk about the true cost of running Britain and whether we are getting good value for our money. We also take a deep dive into pensions, discussing auto-enrolment, the ageing population and the future of the state pension. Let's get started. Hello, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hello. Thanks very much for having me. Chris, lovely to see you again. Yeah, you as well. Good to be here. Paul, we'd like all our guests to start off with their journey, how they got started and what took them to where they are today. Currently director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Yeah, uh, well, I've actually started my life here at the IFS Institute for Fiscal Studies decades and decades ago. I'm have to say, start my working life here anyway, as a young researcher working on inequality and pensions and tax and various things like that, then went off and spent a bit of time at what was the Financial Services Authority, now the Financial Conduct Authority, then Department of Education as Chief Economist, so I did lots of very interesting work on student loans and school performance and all those sorts of things. Then at the Treasury, where I'm afraid I was a director for public spending, saying no to lots of people when they wanted money. I actually wasn't saying no that much because this was under the in the brown years when there was lots of money around. Strange set of uh, responsibilities there, everything from public sector pay through to transport and climate change. Then some time in consulting, an organization called Frontier Economics, and then back to the IFS as director a bit more than a decade ago now. And I suppose the thing I've always worked on in all of that time has been the economics of public policy in one way or another, and that's really what the IFS does. We look at the public finances, tax, welfare, pensions, health, education, labor markets, inequality, all of those things that really matter to all of us are where we do a lot of really important and interesting empirical, uh, always empirical, as in we analyze lots and lots of data research. Would you say that you hold the, the government to account then in terms of cross-checking what they're spending and what they're bringing in taxes? To some extent. I mean, we do all sorts of things. And actually, quite a lot of my colleagues spend a lot of time doing very academic work. But yes, I, I think a significant part of our raison d'etre is to hold government to account. We are an independent charity, a research institute, and when governments or oppositions, and in election year actually particularly oppositions, say things about how much they're spending or what the effect of that spending is likely to be or what they're thinking about doing in terms of taxes or how they're designing taxes and so on, then we will run the rule over it. We are absolutely independent. We are determinedly politically wholly independent. So we will only say things which are as, as objective as we think we can be on the basis of the data. And that does, to some extent, allow us to call politicians out when they're saying things we don't think quite add up. So how much on an annual basis does the government spend then? Because we hear about government spending, but how much do they actually spend? Oh, it's a bit more than a trillion pounds a year. So a bit more than a thousand billion. So that's a really wow. very big number indeed. And that's uh, a bit more now than 40% of national income. So something like 42% of national income from memory at the moment. So more than four pounds in every 10 is produced and consumed in the economy is spent by the government. And of course, most of that is therefore taken by the government from the economy, mostly in taxes. So the government is a huge player, as you'd expect it in all of our lives. But and it really is very, it really is very big indeed when you think about it like that. Uh, and yeah. you said it's over 40% of national. How has that trended over the last 20, 30 years ago? Where was it then? Where were the numbers? Or further back? Do you know, the, the surprising thing is it hasn't changed and particularly the tax side of this hasn't changed very much in quite a long period. And that's quite surprising in some ways, given that we, we know we're spending far more on 
health particularly, but also on pensions and welfare and so on than we used to. Now, on the spending side, that's partly, there's two things again. Obviously, if you go back 50 years and more, government was running a bunch of nationalized industries, which it no longer does. But the other big, the, the biggest thing actually, is that government has stopped really spending money on defense. Now, that's a slight exaggeration, of course, but if you go back 70 years, we were spending about 10% of all of national income on defense, and that's now 2%. Wow, so wow. Huge wow. reduction in our defense spending, and that's essentially been transferred into spending on the welfare state, on health, and so on. But the other thing that's worth saying is that over this parliament, and again, particularly if you look at the tax side, we've seen a historically big increase in the size of government, partly because of spending on debt interest, partly because we are actually hitting a moment when population aging is beginning to have an effect, and partly, of course, because the economy hasn't been growing very fast. Actually, whilst in one sense, particularly tax as a fraction of national income, has been remarkably stable for a long time, it has actually ratcheted up over the last four or five years. It's interesting. Yeah. When people think about taxes, people obviously automatically think about the taxes that they pay individually, personally. But what other sources are there where the government gets its money from? Because there must be companies and other sources of income as well that it raises. Yeah. The big three are income tax, which obviously just comes straight out of people's income, national insurance contributions, which comes out of your earnings, but a, a bigger fraction of that, at least formally, is paid by employers, and VAT. So actually, about knocking on for two thirds of all of the tax revenue does come in one way or another fairly directly out of our <laughs> individual pockets. But of course, and, and then, of course, there, there's things like council tax as well, and inheritance tax and capital gains tax and so on. I think the most important thing to give your mind when you think about tax is that income tax, national insurance, VAT, count, but almost two thirds of all tax revenue. And so when governments are talking about big changes, that's where they need to look. Corporation tax is the next biggest. And of course, that's gone up pretty sharply in the last year. You've then got business rates and capital tax. And then there's the sort of collective excise duties on petrol, particularly alcohol and tobacco. And then you've got stamp duties and then a whole series of smaller things like inheritance tax, capital gains tax, and there are dozens of other smaller taxes. So there's quite an array of them, but there's a relatively small number which are really important. So you've got the big three, you can come back to national insurance, VAT, then you've got corporation tax, then the next three are business rates, council tax, and duty on petrol. So you mentioned then the big three where the government generates its money from. Where does it spend those taxes? Where are the big departments that absorb most of that tax money? Well, again, you've got a big three. You've got health, which is the biggest single spending area. It's depending on how you count it, something knocking over 180 billion a year. So that's a lot of money. Then you've got benefits for pensioners, benefits for people over state pension age. And then you've got benefits for people under state pension age and put those two together. And from memory, you're looking at getting on for 250, 300 billion. Put that together with health and you've got a big chunk. You've got a really big chunk of the total spending. So health, pensioner benefits and welfare benefits, people under pension age. And then after that, you've got education. After that, you've got, it depends how you think about local government. There's a chunk of local government, of course. You've got defense. And then again, a lot of other areas of spending, but a lot of them are much, much, much smaller than those. And again, I think you know, one of the key issues, people don't tend to have these sort of scales in their mind. You could double the amount we spend on the police for an amount which the NHS probably wouldn't even notice. These are very, very different orders of magnitude when you're looking at spending on these different things. And of course, we also think of the benefits for pensioners and people of working age in a different way to all of the rest, because that's, as it were, the government's taking money from us and giving it straight back as cash. Whereas things like health and education, so on, they're buying stuff and producing services. And actually, it's quite important to think about those as different. They have different effects on the economy and providing health uses up actual economic resources, whereas taking money from me and giving it to a poor person or a pensioner doesn't actually use up economic resources. It just takes it from me and gives it to someone else. Have you ever addressed the efficiency of expenditure as well? It's interesting in our business, the more money you chuck at things sometimes, the less efficient it is spent, the less efficient it becomes. That's a distinct possibility, shall we say, with the NHS. But as I say, in my arena, there is a risk sometimes when you throw too much at something, you get a diminishing returns relatively. Yeah, and there are certainly risks of that. In my book, I quote, to in the 2010s, we had really did have proper cuts in various bits of public spending. And I remember at the time very clearly a head of a local authority telling me that prior to 2010, they had, quotes been pissing money against the wall, unquotes, because there was just so much around. 
and you can see it in the 2000s as well, lots and lots of extra money went to the health service. And actually, you can see that created inflation in the health service and the costs of other things went up. There's also lots of inefficiency, clearly, in the public sector, which is a lot of the inefficiency in the health service at the moment. It's actually related to lack of investment over the last 10 years. They don't have the MRI scanners. They have buildings that are falling down, and they don't certainly don't have the IT systems, which would allow them to be more efficient. There's lots of inefficiency in there. Certainly, you can see in the past how that's been related to too much money, but I think you can also see how it's related to lack of investment or just lack of quality of management and lack of... Um, uh, you know, the, the sort, of, sort of investment in the right things. You look over the last 20 years and there have been some shocking wastes of, of money, whether that's on NHS IT systems or whether there was a period in the 2010s when they built fire stations that never got used on and so on. There's a, there's a wonderful book by Ivor Crew and Anthony King, I think, called The Blunders of Our Governments, which goes through some of the more egregious, appalling wastes that governments have managed over the last few decades. Yeah, I can imagine. I can mm. imagine. How are we getting value for money then in this far in every term that's been spent? Not everywhere, but broadly speaking, it's worth putting that in context. We spend as a country less than most Western European countries. So our levels of tax and our levels of spending are lower than they are in most countries, much lower than in France, distinctly lower than in Germany and the Netherlands, much, much lower than in Scandinavia. You know, one sense we've made a choice to have a smaller state and lower taxes than some of those countries. And one of the big differences is that the French and Germany, they're incredibly generous with their pensions, for example, and when we're not, and we depend on our private sector for pensions. The health service is average for Western European standards in terms of the amount that goes in, but it's below average in terms of how good it is. So I think you're probably not getting great value for money there. There was a time not that long ago where you said, look, we don't spend much on the NHS, but it's quite efficient. But I think we now we do spend quite a lot on the NHS and the outcomes are dreadful. We're, we're recording this on the day that the Times Health Commission reports, and I'm a member of that. And it's been absolutely shocking seeing some of the stories there about how badly people are treated in the NHS, as in the staff, how appallingly badly they're treated, how badly some parts of it are managed, and what the consequences of some of that has been for so many patients. Yeah, there's a lot to do to make things better. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. This is a bit of an aside, but the veterinary sector is just going through a CMA review, veterinary services. Oh, yes. I just Unfortunately, we had to take our dog to the vet today. It was seen immediately. The cost wasn't cheap, but no queue, no wait. Wonderful service. The poor old veterinary sectors are getting in the next, for potentially overcharging or whatever. But unfortunately, it's a case of you pay your money and you're getting actually a pretty good response in that area. Compared with the NHS, we'd have taken our dog into an NHS. We'd still be waiting probably this evening to be seen. The difference is dark. It, it treat our dogs better than they treat us. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Worryingly, yeah, shockingly, I mean, it's the case, isn't it? Very sad state of affairs. I think that we're an interesting movement in the health. Obviously, we have the NHS. It's huge. One of the biggest employers in the world. Costs, as I said, £180 billion pounds or, or something like that. But still providing quite poor treatment for quite a lot of people. And there's definitely some very clear evidence that more people over the last couple of years have decided to pay privately uh, as a result. And there's an interesting question as to whether the balance between public and private sectors will shift. We've always had a private sector in the UK, but there's an interesting question as to whether more of it will shift accidentally, not as part of government intended policy, but accidentally because of the pressures on waiting lists and the poor. poor so care. should those people that are paying privately be let off the, the cost of paying, supporting the NHS? If you go down that route, then you end the NHS because on average, people who are paying privately are paying a lot more towards the NHS because on average, they'll have higher incomes. And again, one of the things I go through in my book is 30% of income tax is paid by 1% of adults. And that's probably most of that 1% may well be paying for their health privately. If you lose revenues from that group of people, then you're done. So no, you couldn't possibly do that. Not, not if you wanted to keep a welfare state in any sense. Yeah. Which is a great concept at its heart. Yeah, I do wonder if we'll end up trending towards more like an American model where it's more insurance-based, like the veterinary has done, where it's insurance-based. I hope where... not. I mean, that, the American system is a disaster. It's, it's astonishing. The US spends as much, if not more, on public health care as we do, and yet most of the working age population has to pay privately anyway. So the US pays far more, far more on health than any other country. It's not just a little bit more, but far more than any other country and still manages to have lots of people who aren't properly covered. It's worth saying the, the U.S. health system is unique. It's uniquely stupid 
and it is unique in the world. There's no other country yeah, got yeah, as Yeah, I've heard some world. shocking stories of it. I mean, members of my own family have had incredible, and you, you asked to part with your credit card before you looked after. As we are moving into an era of aging population and shrinking birth rate, do you foresee that taxes will keep on rising? I think they probably will. I'm sorry, that's not very happy news. I think they probably will. They're not inevitable. We have choices here. We have choices about the quality of healthcare we provide, about the scale of state pensions, about the scale of working age benefits, about how much we expect people to pay privately and so on. Given the, the supplement I think we have as a nation, we pretty much know that health spending is going to rise as a fraction of national income over time, partly because the population's aging, partly because we just want more healthcare as we get richer. There's not much point being rich if you're dead or sick. I think it's not unreasonable to spend more on health as you get better off. As you say, the population is aging, so we'll spend more on pensions and social care and those sorts of things. And the other thing in the sort of medium run is that we know, and you just see this by reading the papers, that I mean, prisons are full to overflowing. There are huge delays in the justice system. Local authorities keep going bust. Universities are making a hell of a fuss about what income they get. And so on and so on. There are lots and lots of pressures on public spending. Now, you can choose to keep a lid on those, but I think that becomes increasingly hard over time. The media would have us believe that tax the rich. You've mentioned there that 30% of income comes in from 1%. So could we just tax the rich more? Is that a solution? Well, as I say, in terms of income tax, yeah, we already get an awful lot of our income tax from people on high incomes. That's partly because they've got very high incomes. Uh, you just give you a sense. Top 1% of incomes, people over, above, I can't remember now, somewhere between 150, 180,000 a year pre-tax. Top 0.1% of incomes, the way in the, in the real stratosphere, you need to be on about 600, 700,000 a year. And we get a lot of tax just from that top 0.1%. It's, it's, it's interesting, the income distribution, isn't it? You get 99% of the population within about 150,000 pounds of each other. And then you got 0.9% and you got hundreds of thousands of pounds. So the inequality at the top is particularly remarkable. We could get a bit more, I think, from the rich, but not huge amounts and probably not huge amounts from people on high incomes. I think if you increase the top income tax rate from 50, 45 to 50, you'd probably get a small couple of billion extra. Do we run the risk then of pushing people? Well, indeed. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, with no behavioral change, increasing the top rate fifty percent will get you. I can't remember ten billion, but you probably only get about two of that. Partly because some people would go offshore. Partly because some people do other avoidance things, use capital gains tax, or have you. But some economists would say you get nothing or even negative amounts. So you can't get lots of money for sure just by increasing top rates of income tax. There's some money to be had in closing inheritance tax loopholes. There's certainly loopholes in capital gains tax that need to be shut. We need to tax um, expensive properties through council tax more than we do. Um, There's something extraordinary. Um, economist, I think it was last week, the council tax on Buckingham Palace uh, is less than £2,000 a year. It's in band H, as you expect, it's in the top band. And more than 40% of households in Britain pay more council tax than Buckingham Palace. That's crazy. Completely wow. insane. That's partly because Westminster has very low levels of council tax. But it's partly because council tax is regressive in the sense that it's capped at band H and it's lower as a fraction of property value, the more expensive the property. And of course, it's based on 1991 values. There are a whole series of things you need to do to make the, cap, the tax system better. And you viewing that, you get some more money from particularly I think, people with higher levels of wealth. But I don't think we're talking game-changing numbers. I don't have a number for this, but if you really went for it, you might get top end 20 billion, absolute top end. And that's out of more than a trillion. So that's not, this is not a game game. Well, IHT alone is about seven, isn't it? So it's a exactly. tiddler. Uh, well, a bit more now, I think. But yeah, it's, it's a bit of a tiddler. It, it, it's growing over time as there are more inheritance. Uh, and notwithstanding the reliefs, as you, I think, have pointed out in your book, most of the UK's wealth is stored in its property. So a lot of the IHT is being effectively paid on real estate, isn't it? On death. Yeah, but again, one of the absurdities of inheritance tax is if you, if you own a not card house and, and needs to be basically worth more than a million before you pay inheritance tax, you basically you can't really avoid inheritance tax, or at least if it's an own occupied house, you basically pay inheritance tax on it. If you've got other forms of wealth, then it's pretty easy to avoid. And, and you see this, that, that the average tax rate on estates of £2 million is about twice the average tax rate on estates of £10 million. It's ridiculous. And it's just because if you're properly rich, and you're, if you've got billions, then you pay nothing. If you're properly rich, you can just drive a coach and horses through the system. I think you alluded to the Duke of Westminster's estate didn't pay very much, did it? On the... Well, indeed, it was so big, you ought to have been able to see it in the tax figures, but you certainly couldn't. Basically, if you, to quote one of my predecessors, 
if you're healthy, wealthy, and well advised, you just don't have to pay inheritance tax. With some of these reliefs, the intention is to support growth. You alluded to the one on AIM shares. In theory, that's in supporting growth companies. I think there are lots of things you might do to increase growth right across the piece in terms of thinking about investment and so on. They've got R&D tax credits and you might want to sort out the corporation tax system to do that. But in terms of thinking about investment and so on, it is mad. Our defined benefit pension schemes have got nearly all of their money in government gilts. For instance, there are definitely better ways you could organize defined contribution schemes. In terms of government policy, stamp duty is very clearly anti-growth. The way that we tax capital gains is bad for growth. The way that we tax the self-employed differently to employees, differently to companies is bad for growth. I can tell you the fact we don't invest enough in roads and infrastructure and housing is bad for growth. Our failure on further education is bad for growth. I can tell you a hundred ways in which we fail on growth. What sort of suggestions would you say then? What sort of like the top three or five to encourage growth? On the tax system, I would get rid of stamp duty straight away and reform council tax. On spending side, I would protect spending on investment, as I say, roads, and I'd build more houses, sort out the planning system, and then I'd really try and do something much better with vocational and further education. Those would be among the priorities. And what's so frustrating is that I think, broadly speaking, government kind of knows that these are the things that you need to do, and just doesn't do them. What, what's your view as well on that, on the, for example, the EIS or the VCT rules to supporting and obviously you're getting a lot of reliefs around those income tax, capital gains tax relief, and inheritance tax relief on EIS shares. Do you think, do you think they're a good mechanism? I don't know whether they're the best way of getting money into the sector. I don't know any good work on that, if I'm honest. No, I was interested to know maybe the costly benefits of those kind of schemes, but yeah, I, don't, I haven't seen any data on it. Do you think the recent proposal by Jeremy Hunt to direct defined contribution pensions into the small cap space is an alternative to including AIM shares? Do you think well, clearly these schemes ought to be able to do that? They ought to be able to take proper account of the relative risks and returns there. I think that there is certainly some evidence that these things are not as efficiently allocated as they could be. As I said earlier, I think the, the biggest appalling situation at the moment is the vast amount of defined benefit pension money, which is not in equities. I know there are lots of reasons for this, partly de-risking, partly because of the, the, the age of the um, population that they're covering and so on. But there's n- no good economic reason for having such a tiny fraction um, in high risky assets. I think when defined contribution schemes, you know, they're the whole bigger question here about where, whether they need to be consolidated, whether we need to be moving to collective defined contribution schemes with more risk sharing. But yeah, broadly speaking, I think there are ways of getting better allocation than we have at the moment. I think that risk is a key. The definition of risk seems questionable. I think a lot of people are encouraged when they first select their risk profiles. Risk equals volatility, which is wrong. And volatility is relative to time period, as you mentioned. Yeah. People often, we, we've been discussing, people often make a selection very early on in their career life, which goes to determine their pension scheme 20 years out. They never look at it again. So it's an educational piece at the beginning, I think. I don't think there's anything we're going to do about this to stop people just going into default funds and not being active with it. It's too difficult. It's too boring. You're just pushing too hard against human nature. What I think we need is better default funds. We know that, was it 98% of the money in Nest, for example, is in the default fund? You might probably get that down to 90%. I don't know, but you're never going to get it below 50%. So I think getting the default fund in these things right is much the most important thing. Education, as I indicated at the beginning, doing this kind of thing for too long, and it's always the go-to option, and it has never worked. And look at the effect of auto-enrollment. It's been unbelievable. It's, it's been 90 plus percent of people have auto-enrolled into pensions. I think when mm. the policy was being dreamt up, the you know, 75% will be a triumph. 90%. Plus, but it's all into the default fund. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's nice spinner nice in the wrong kind of yeah. choice. Yeah, so it's re- it makes it really tricky because then it makes the nudge, the default, basically the choice I mean, is pretty close to being compulsory because that's just how people behave. And that puts lots and lots of responsibility on government in terms of what it says has to happen and on the provider in terms of its default choice. And I think there is some case for saying that these default funds ought to be higher volatility, but higher return over the long run, because as you say, these are long run investments and we shouldn't be thinking about risk in terms of volatility. We should be thinking about it in terms of long-term returns. But beyond the, there's a more broad issue here, which worries me about where we've ended up with pensions is that, as I said, we've moved away from defined benefit schemes. They're basically dead in the private sector to defined contribution schemes where all the risk actually in the end does sit with the individual. Not only that, we've got no annuitization either. 
all the risks sits with the post, post retirement age as well. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, I find it shocking that we can't engage. I know you say it's pushing against a rock. It's such a relevant, significant cost that the employee is paying out every month, yet they're more engaged with probably how much a pint of milk's costing. But I think it's partly the fault of the finance industry. I don't have a financial advisor because I find it impossible to find one. He won't basically rip me off. Well, I agree. We have a knack of making things overcomplicated for starters. Do you think the pension system needs a bit of an overhaul? It was created many decades ago for a much smaller population, serving a smaller cohort of people. We've already mentioned we've got an aging population. Well, of course, the pension system has changed hugely year by decade by decade. As I say, we did have a world of defined benefit schemes. They're all dead outside of the public sector. We did have a generous state earnings related pension scheme, which we've got rid of. We did have compulsory annuitization if you had a defined contribution scheme, which we've got rid of. So I think it's certainly it's, it's wrong to say that you know, the scheme we have at the moment bears any relationship to the one we had a, a generation or two ago. But we are looking at the IFS. Uh, we we're doing a big review of the pension system. I think some of what we've got is good. I think a, a straightforward flat rate state pension makes sense. You build on that with private saving. But as we've discussed, there are, there are definitely things you need to do on the private side. And I think one of the things that is much under discussed is this issue about essentially nobody annuitizes now. You get to retirement with a pot of a hundred thousand pounds or a million pounds or whatever. Again, it's in my book. I can't remember exactly the numbers, but a 65 year old man has got something like a 25% chance of dying before he hits 75 and a 25% chance of living beyond 90. How the heck are you supposed to manage your finances in that level of uncertainty? It's essentially impossible. So we've been left in an impossible situation. Interesting. Yeah. Do you think the state pension is sustainable? There's many under the age of 40 who have the belief that they won't even see a state pension. I mean, there is. I mean, part of our work, we did a survey which showed exactly that. I, yes, I do think it's sustainable. I mean, it's, it's not growing very fast as a fraction of national income. It's much smaller than in most other Western countries. And in terms of people thinking they won't get it, I think they're wrong. The state pension has been there for whatever it is, seven, depending on when you count it. You could argue for more than a century. It's gone up at least in line with prices for the last seven, every year for the last 60 years. I'd be astonished if it's not still there in 50 years' time. Do you think triple lock is in danger of being abolished? The triple lock is a strange thing, isn't it? it? It results in the pension being a sort of random number in a few years' time. It goes up by each year by the higher of inflation earnings growth than 2.5%. So you could have inflation at 10% this year and 0% the year after, but earnings growth at 0% this year and 10% the year after, and you get 20% increase in your pension, which is crackers. You could argue that it's politically the best, if you think the state pension should be higher than it is, and I think that's a reasonable thing you might think, then you might also think that the best way of getting it up to a higher level is via the triple lock rather than via some more rational policy. You take your choice on that one. You mentioned there that an auto enrollment has been a huge success, but how can the finance industry and the government collectively help raise the awareness of the importance of funding one's retirement? Because yes, being enrolled into auto enrollment is only one step, but 33% of those who have a pension don't even know who the provider is. And 80% don't even know how much is in their pension pot. So as Chris has alluded to, these people are going to be approaching 50, 55, 60 and may not even have enough. So I, I also question if it can be called a success. If it's gone in the wrong place. Yeah. That's an abject failure, I would have thought. The concept's a success, but the execution of it has been an abject failure, which circle back, it becomes a pretty big failure because you're not ending any further forward. You, all you've done is outsource the responsibility to the individual. And unfortunately, you've outsourced it to the wrong lot of outsourcers. To some extent, I agree. But how you fix that, I'm not entirely sure. I do think education is probably involved in some way. But the, the narrative, the story around it, the engagement is obviously going to be important. But my concern is that with the aging population, healthcare, pensions, and the just the lack of awareness that the average person has of their own pension pot, where it's been invested in, how much it will be when they approach 55, 60, it was just storing up a massive problem. As Chris pointed out, I think we've outsourced the responsibility onto the individual, but without telling them. We don't really have a narrative in this country. I think partly perhaps maybe financial services have done a good job of this. If you want help within the financial space, you go and seek financial advice, which is you pointed out, you said that you do it yourself. And I think that is storing up a huge problem that we won't see the results of till later on down the line. Yeah, I think it's a big problem. I think the system is too complicated. 
people are not engaged. It's very difficult to engage people with auto roll. We're stuck with people moving from job to job as they build up lots of different mm. pots. Very difficult to understand these things. A lot of companies are still using legacy IT systems, which are not comfortable or easy for people to use. Charges are often unclear. People don't understand what it's going to mean to get to 65 or 70 with a pot of money and not know how to invest that or make the most of it. Uh, yeah, I think there are all, all sorts of issues out there. And, and there are lessons from, from other countries. I think at least on the accumulation phase, uh, I think we might want to think more about the way that Australia does it, where you've got a, a much smaller number of much bigger funds. There's, there's lots of public information about how well those different funds are doing. People are much more engaged and more money is going in the default, although compulsory rates much higher than it is here. You know, they're, they're starting from where we are, that's the sort of place you might look. We also know that in the Netherlands, they've got much better at forms of risk sharing than we have here. So there are models out there, but changes to the way that pensions work takes too long. They're obviously very long lived things and they take an awfully long time to shift. Yeah, you met, I think you were involved in the discussions when you originally around auto enrollment. How, how long did that take actually to come into play from your initial, initial concept? To... The initial concept was really proposed by the Turner Review in the mid 2000s. I was involved in a review of it in 2010, 2011, as the new government came in. And actually, to be fair, this is one of those policies that had cross party support. So it was introduced, or the legislation so started off under the last Labour government, was pushed through by the coalition. And I think the, I can't remember when you know, it started to be rolled out in, I can't remember, 2013 or something, and was fully rolled out by 2017. That's still about eight years, though, isn't it? Probably looking at a decade. Yeah. Wow. And then obviously, it's going to be 40 years before anyone's been in it for the whole of their working life. It's a long time, isn't it, to get, I understand that's a significant piece of legislation and quite. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the, one of the greatest examples of how long pension policy lasts is that it's not that long since the last recipient of widows or family pensions from the American Civil War stopped being paid. Part actually because Civil War veterans married very young women back in the 1930s and those very young women didn't start die out until just five or six years ago. That's interesting, isn't it? Paul, this is brilliant. Where can they follow? Where can they connect? Where can they get your book from? Oh, you get my book from all, all, all booksellers or online from the, the big ones and independent ones. It's only about a tenner. Now it's out in paperback and fully updated right through to the end of last year. And as the review in the Times said, it's gripping and horrifying, witty and brilliant. Buy it and say it better myself. That's it. Yeah. And I'll make sure those links are there as well. And also I'll make sure the links to your podcast and many of the great articles you've wrote as well are, are in the show notes below. So just scroll down and you can quickly okay. find more well, information. You, um, Thank you. Thanks great. very much. Interesting talking to you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy this type of content, please subscribe and leave us a comment to let us know. If you want to learn more about Paul Johnson or buy his book, or indeed more about Chris and fundamental asset management, then all the links are just below in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you have a great week.